I am dreading the 26th of January 2018. You see, I have a son, and he is the love of my life, and I want him to experience the fullness and richness of it all. I want him to wake up in a tent on the top of a mountain as he sees the sunrise and drink in the cool morning air. I want him to build spaceships in the back shed. And I want him to write stories about his dreams. But most of all, I just want him to be happy. And that's why I'm dreading the 26th of January, 2018, that day when I let go of my son's hand as he steps through the gate to his first day of school. You see, for me, School was largely just felt like a waste of time. I remember one time in year nine, my year nine teacher had this activity that we would do where we'd conjure up a scenario and remember the sights, smells and sounds of a particular scenario. Today's scenario was Noah's Ark. And when the teacher got to the question, what would it have smelled like in Noah's Ark? <laughs> you can see it coming, right? <laughs> Cheeky me, I raised my hand, and I said what had to be said. <laughs> Poo, miss. <laughs> My cheeky but honest and truthful answer was not received with joy, and I was sent to the vice principal's office. <laughs> Unfortunately, this was an analogy of much of my school life. You see, though, there was another me. In that same year, in year nine, I was winning awards for raising the most amount of money for charity, and I'd done that throughout my whole school life. There was another me that was going to the woodwork room at lunchtime and designing and building my own furniture, and then going to the textiles room and designing and building my own clothes. They were awful, <laughs> but they were mine. And it was self-driven learning. And at home, I was restoring a boat that I'd bought from the trading post, remember that, for $50, and I was doing it all on my own. Unfortunately, none of these things counted for my grades, and none of this kind of learning mattered an inch to what was said on my report card. You see, it's not that I hated learning. I loved learning. It's just that learning in school felt unnatural and hard. But learning in life, we all know, it just happens. We're born to do it. Just like the time when my $50 trading post boat capsized in the middle of a lake and I was on my own. You learn. And these are the lessons that you never forget. So fast forward to today. I run an open source, non-profit organisation that supports communities around the world to build a better world for their children. Anyone, anywhere, can come to our website and they can download our five-step manual and other resources. They can get any of our designs if they want to use them. And they can start a project on our site where they can get volunteers and do some fundraising to build their own playground. So, the other thing we do, this is where I was last week. Hi, TEDx Melbourne. I'm in Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, and we've just finished this playground. We started with a bunch of old tires, some floor tiles, some soil. We found an old metal water tank, some logs and a bunch of other stuff. And we took the teachers and the students' ideas through a community consultation, and this is what we did. So we created this awesome wide tile slide. The community found over 300 car tyres, so we created these motorbikes. Because we had so many car tyres, we were able to create this massive sand pit full of beautiful local beach sand. We had these steering wheels from old tractors that we found in the community, so we built this bus to take you to town. We found an old rusty water tank, and from the roof of the water tank and the ribs around the edge, we created this amphitheatre. We created this climbing frame. And at the end of two and a half weeks, this is what we ended up with. Yeah. 
what course do you study to learn how to do that? It's called the School of Life. So while I was in Papua New Guinea doing what I do best, working with these local communities, 13 other communities started projects on our website from the Philippines to Zambia to the Dominican Republic. One of these projects was in Guatemala. And during the community concept consultation phase, a little boy named Alang drew this awesome picture, which I love. That's a little stairway going up his leg and a couple of swings. And the two leaders of the program, pro, this project, Matt and Aunt Chris, went to work taking these dreams and turning them into life, and this is what they built. How awesome is that? And these projects are happening all over the world. It's such a heartening process. Local people doing local things for their children. By the end of this year, we will have supported more than 1,000 schools and communities to build playgrounds in their communities. And we will have impacted the lives of over 250,000 children this year alone. And we're growing exponentially. This is something that people are picking up and running with because they know it's important. I'm not driving it. So let me just shift a little bit to the bigger picture. At the moment, an incredible thing has happened. Over 90% of the world's children are going to school. And this offers an incredible opportunity for people, for children to be lifted out of poverty. But sadly, the reality on the ground is a lot worse than what you might imagine. In Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, two-thirds of those children, UNESCO reports, after four years of their childhood lives, are failing the minimum benchmarks. That's, if I took this audience, that's 800 people failing. And the, and the minimum benchmarks include things like learning to read and write a simple sentence. I want you to just digest what a colossal loss of human potential that is. When you look around at these schools, you see these similarities all over the world. And I'm just going to outline some. They are learning deserts. First of all, let's take little Josiah here. Josiah is in a classroom where he gets almost no attention from the teacher. He's one of 50, or maybe, as has been reported in Yemen, one of 500 or 150 on average in South Sudan. He has zero access to toys, books and resources and other stimulating materials. Or, unfortunately, and this is much more common than you think, they have the resources, but because they're so precious, they lock them in a cupboard. This has got to stop. And lastly, because of the sheer numbers in the class and often the low-trained nature of the teacher, they re and actually just tradition and, you know, Catholic training or whatever it is from the 50s, children, uh, the teachers resort to rote learning, six hours a day. And I don't just mean one plus one equals, I mean one plus one equals two, repeat. Zero thinking. This is a serious issue, and it's not just an educational issue, this is a medical issue. We now know through MRI scans that children living in poverty have visibly less grey matter. The grey matter that does the information processing and all the important stuff we need in our modern lives. So what do we do to turn this chronic issue around? What do we, what do, we do to help these children to thrive? Well, it turns out that you need to start much earlier and you need to do something completely, surprise, surprise, different to school. And I'm sure most people here would agree with that. I agree with neuropsychologist Stephen Sivy, who said, when looking at children's brains in play, he just said, play just lights the brain up. It's diverse. So let me now take you to Jamaica. It's 1986. And I want to introduce you to two young, stunted children, Sam and Jessica. Sam is on a path we all know. He's part of the control group and his life continues on as normal to somewhere where we expect low levels of education, low, le low earnings and low levels of health. 
Jessica, on the other hand, is part of a deceptively simple experiment. Elaine Burke, a local health worker, goes to her house and simply encourages Jessica and her mother to interact and to play together and pay attention to one another. They use simple things in the home, plastic cups, wooden spoons. And this, re this is repeated with Jessica's cohort across Kingston, Jamaica. After two years, so it's one hour a week, that's 104 hours in total between the age of one and three. After two years, the experiment ends. 20 years later, the researchers return, and what they find is that Jessica is not only doing better academically and has a great chance at high school now and even getting a bachelor's degree, she's earning 42% more than Sam's group. That's incredible. 42% more earnings a month equates to 18 years of additional salary. Can you imagine the difference it would make to her? Can you imagine the difference it would make to the GDP of a nation if they had time and space to play? These studies have been repeated over the years uh, in the US, and the play cohort is now 50, over 50 years old. What we're finding is 44% increase in high school graduations, 17% increase in bachelor degrees, 50% lower rates of crime and imprisonment, and seven times higher rates of employment based on whatever age you were when you left school. You also, for the 21st century, your children will learn these kind of things that are absolutely crucial for the 21st century. Self-control, problem solving, creative thinking and social skills. And for all the bean counters out there, you don't need to worry. All of these interventions, uh, economist James Heckman says, has estimated that they return 7 to 10 percent per annum when these children reach uh, adulthood. An incredible benefit. Most social programs cost money. These programs make money for society. So what if play went viral across the world? Well, I've got good news. The Papua New Guinean project I just showed you was opened by the Deputy Secretary of the Ministry of Education of Papua New Guinea. And he said that the curriculum we're moving towards is a more playful curriculum. And at the opening, we didn't expect it. He said, I want to see playgrounds at every school across the country. And today, I can announce that we're in the final stages of planning to work with the Ministry of Education in East Timor to build playgrounds in early childhood centres across the country. I come here with a simple message. If you want your children to thrive, and if we want the world's children to thrive, we need to invest in them when they're young. We must create time and space for children to play. Thank you.